How will we address the climate crisis? Climate One with Greg Dalton brings together advocates, influencers, and policymakers in empowering conversations that connect all aspects of the climate emergency, the individual and the systemic, the scary and the exciting, to help you understand the most critical issue of our time. Because addressing the climate crisis begins by talking about it. Rick Ridgway estimates he spent over five years of his life in tents, often in the world's most remote places, alongside fellow outdoor adventurers Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, and Doug Tompkins, the co-founder of the North Face. Ridgway himself worked for Patagonia for 15 years and was behind the company's infamous Don't Buy This Jacket ad campaign, which paradoxically prompted increased sales. What is the role of corporations in conservation? And where is the line between greenwashing and truly sustainable business practices? Join us for a conversation with one of the world's foremost mountaineers and former VP at Patagonia, Rick Ridgway, today on Climate One. Congratulations on your book, Life Lived Wild, Adventures at the Edge of the Map. I think it's uh, published today. So. Yeah, today is the official release date. Well, thanks for joining us on this special day. So your latest book, Life Lived Wild, chronicles decades of your adventures at the edge of the map. What has been the appeal for you in going where others have not? Well, it started, uh, you know, as things like this usually do, I suppose, with uh, a lot of people that uh, get passionate and obsessive about a single thing at an early age. And uh, one of the earliest influences for me was when I was 14 years old and uh, got a copy of the National Geographic in the mailbox with the article about the first American ascent of Mount Everest. Mm. Uh, and in it was a picture of Jim Whittaker, the first American to climb Everest, uh, standing on the summit, holding his ice axe up with hurricane winds blowing the American and National Geographic flags tied to the axe handle. And I saw that and it disconnected with me. And I said, I, I want to be that guy. Uh, that's how it started. Cool. And early in the book, you relate a conversation you had with Nima Norbu, one of the, your guides on the American Bicentennial Everest expedition. She says that if Sherpas could make the same money some other way, they wouldn't go on these dangerous trips, especially if they could be home with wives and children. She goes on to say that Sherpas think Americans on this expedition are kind of silly. Maybe, quote, maybe you people have too much money and you don't know how to spend it. So how do you think about that in terms of, did you think about privilege back in those days? Um, I did. And that uh, story is the first chapter of, of, of the book. Um, after I saw that article in National Geographic, I uh, tried to teach myself how to climb. Uh, that set off the warning buzzer in my mother's uh, maternal instincts. And she sent me to Outward Bound School as a high school graduation president, and, and I was hooked. So I started going on mountaineering trips. And eventually, even in my mid-20s, that led to an invitation to join the first American ascent, uh, the, the second American attempt to on Mount Everest following the first ascent in the National Geographic article that had inspired me to start. So there I was in my mid-20s on the highest mountain in the world, and uh, I was convinced I was going to make it to the top. You know, I just wanted it so bad. Uh, and then at about the 26,000 foot level, uh, I got sick. And I got an infection in my lungs, and, and that was it. I was, I was knocked down, and, and I didn't make the top, but my climbing partner did. And I had to reconcile that. I had to figure out, uh, you know, I had to look inside why I was so disappointed. And it was a mirror. Looking back at myself, I could see that the answer to the question was, uh, I was disappointed because it was Everest and it was all about my ego and, and not about what I could spiritually get out of an experience like that. And, and, and that became a, a considerable, you know, introspection. And, and, and that's why I chose to open the book that way. I thought it was a good way to really challenge this idea that most people have about mountaineers that you know they probably think it's all about reaching the top but what i learned over my lifetime is is that's not the real goal and did your ego uh get in the way of having empathy for the sherpas and the people serving you in that and others in that journey uh, no it, i don't think it it interfered with that but what it did uh reduce was probably what I could have taken from that experience if I would have been more engaged in actually the process. 
uh, and, and less focused just on the top. And I wouldn't have been as disappointed not, not making the summit because I would have understood more deeply what I could get from the process instead of just getting on the summit. And, and that's a, a path that, um, or a realization that took me a considerable amount of my life to, to really figure out. Mm -hmm. It's a privilege to risk your life for pleasure, uh, for some people anyways. And you also say that in mountaineering and in business, it's not about taking risks, but managing risks. Say more about that. My experiences as a mountaineer have taught me a lot of things that I have taken from the high altitudes back down to my life at sea level. And, mm. and part of that life is uh, my business life. So uh, with other uh, colleagues in business, uh, mentors, uh, people like Yvonne Schoenard and, and Doug Tompkins, who have been my climbing partners, you know, we've really taken the, what we've learned on, on the mountains and, and we've applied it to to the businesses that we've been involved in. And I worked at Patagonia for 15 years with uh, Yvonne. And one of the key insights was understanding really how to manage risk and how to uh, take that back into the business life and understand that you, know, you don't want to really take a risk on a climb that uh, is going to kill you. <laughs> and in business, you don't want to take risks that are going to possibly jeopardize the, the health of the business. So, you know, there, there were things like that that we brought back to our sea level life and, and applied to it. Uh, but I think the biggest lesson back taken from the mountains back to the way we ran the businesses was what I just told you about the process, about uh, finally learning that it's not about the summit, but it's the footsteps to get there. And you can apply that to business too. And that you can find the real meaning out of the process of running the business instead of some end game of just trying to create wealth for you. And especially if it's just your shareholders instead of your stakeholders. And, and that's probably the most important lesson that we've taken out of the time we've spent in the mountains, especially the time we've spent in nature and applied back to business. That it's not just about the business creating wealth, but it's about creating good for the whole system, for all the stakeholders. And that's certainly the way that we ran Patagonia over the years. Uh, that's why it was in business, to be an agent for environmental and conservation protection. Yvonne Chouinard and Doug Tompkins became your mentors as you became this ac accidental businessman. Uh, you're all skeptical of business and capitalism. You know, why did you continue building a company that was selling consumer goods? And how did you reconcile that with your interest in conservation? It, it was a, a, a real dilemma. Uh, I'm trying to figure out whether we were part of the problem or part of the solution, because we were making uh, a lot of stuff, <laughs> and, and, and we realized right in the beginning that stuff has an impact, that no matter how hard you work to reduce the impact of the stuff you're making, uh, it still has a, a really measurable impact. Um, and wrestling with that was the reason we ran that now famous ad uh, back in uh, 2011 on Black Friday, uh, the kickoff to the shopping frenzy of the Christmas season in the New York Times with a photograph of one of our best-selling jackets and above it the headline, don't buy this jacket, because we wanted to shock people to go into the copy of that ad and where we explain that no matter how hard we had tried to make that jacket with no unnecessary harm, <clears throat> it still had used nearly 200 liters of water or gallons to make it. It had still left behind uh, 20 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. It had still created two thirds of its own weight in waste. And we were wrestling with that dilemma at Patagonia, trying to figure out, well, should we continue to grow ourselves? Should we try to figure out how to redefine capitalism so that we could have a, a company that was in stasis that would still survive without growing. <clears throat> and finally, we realized that there was an answer in the emerging science of food and fiber production uh, around using regenerative protocols. So here's the connection. <clears throat> uh, if you can create food and fiber with regenerative farming, then that creates healthy soils which pull carbon out of the air and store it back in the ground. And that was an enormous aha for us because here was an opportunity to make more of our products out of natural fibers 
that were grown regeneratively. Because then, if we could succeed in making products out of fibers uh, that were creating healthy soil, that were drawing carbon out of the air and put it in the ground, then that shirt that you're wearing right now could actually represent carbon atoms that have been sequestered back in the ground. So maybe making consumer goods, making more stuff, could be done with more good than harm. Your identity is as a mountaineer, and that's how you see yourself and others see you. What's the impact on your identity of receding glaciers and mountains that are now dirt rather than covered with beautiful snow? One, one thing spending uh, uh, time in nature, where in the beginning of my book, I, I say that I calculated I've spent over f five years living in tents, and uh, most of that was uh, tents pitched in, in really remote, wild areas, you know, really deep into nature, where uh, I learned over the years and decades to pay attention to nature, to really observe shifts and changes. And as a consequence of that, I was able to see firsthand a ringside seat, as it were, uh, to uh, the retreat of glaciers, to the shift in the patterns of migrating birds. Um, I've actually been able to witness it, to witness geolog the changes which used to be measured in geologic time happening in, in human time. Mm. Uh, and that mm -hmm. is astounding to consider that. Um, it started in the 1980s. I mean, I remember following uh, James Hansen's testimony to, uh, to Congress, as you probably did yourself, uh, Greg. And then uh, probably we also share the impact that uh, Bill McKibben has had on us. Mm -hmm. uh, his book, End of Nature, was a big impact on, on me. Uh, because suddenly I realized that, um, that as Bill argued in the book, um, instead of nature willing the evolution of the world, we're in the driver's seat willing nature, hence the title, The End of Nature. It had, it had a big impact on me. Um, and then one of the expeditions I was fortunate to uh, participate in was a, a traverse of uh, Antarctica on dog sleds. And it started on the Antarctic Peninsula uh, on a feature called the Larsen Ice Shelf, where for a couple of weeks we dog mushed uh, in the Antarctic winter down this ice shelf. Uh, and I remember one night in the tent uh, hearing the ice crack. And I was used to that because I slept on glaciers where ice mm -hmm. is cracking all the time. But this was a different kind of crack. <laughs> this was really shallow and sharp. Um, and uh, a few years later, uh, sitting back at home in, here in California, uh, looking at the newspaper, uh, I saw this article about um, a iceberg yeah. breaking off uh. the Larsen ice shelf right where I had been mm. and floating out to sea. Geologic time happening in human time. And that really drove it home for me. I'm, I'm getting shivers because I think that is my earliest climate conscious moment. I vividly remember seeing Lice Larsen I think it was shelf B, that, you know, there's Larson shelf and a little thumbnail photo in the New York Times before I founded Climate One and saying, oh, that can't be good. And that was, bef my recollection is that was before Inconvenient Truth, et cetera. But for you to actually be there drives it home really how powerful that is. You know, in, in 2015, uh, you were kayaking in Southern Chile with Yvonne Chouinard and North Face founder Doug Tompkins. High waves capsized both of your kayaks, plunging you into 40 degree water. What happened next? Well, it was actually just uh, Doug and I in a double, Doug and okay. me in a, in a double kayak. Um, there were... Uh, four. Uh, there were. We had four boats. We had um, uh, Doug and I were in a double, and uh, two others were in um, a double. And then uh, there was a couple of uh, Yvonne and another in, in single kayaks. And we were um, going along the remote coastline of an enormous lake in southern Chile called uh, General Carrera, and uh, the water was extremely cold. But the conditions were near perfect for the first two days. Uh, and then on the third day, uh, a wind blew up, and we took the day off. Uh, and the next morning, uh, it seemed calm, but we launched uh, our boats, uh, and we headed across a bay towards a point when the wind picked up again uh, very strongly. And this time, it was crosswise to our direction. And Doug and I had been having 
problems with the rudder and our boat malfunctioning, uh, and we were having increasing difficulties keeping the um, kayak pointed uh, down the waves instead of counter to the waves, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then we had this crosswind. Well, the others got ahead of us because we were falling behind, and then uh, uh, the boat uh, turned uh, partly sideways on a wave that tipped us, uh, and we got capsized into this really cold water, and we both knew we were in big trouble. And we tried to right the boat several times and get back in it and paddle, but we kept getting capsized. And then we tried to swim towards the point, and um, I thought I was dead. Uh, the water was actually 39 degrees, and you can't last very long in water that cold. Uh, so second time in my life where uh, the first time was in an avalanche where I've uh, had the seconds and minutes uh, to really consider my life and what I thought was probably my imminent death. But uh, our friends did reappear uh, and started towing us uh, towards the shoreline. And I was unconscious by the time uh, they got me ashore. Uh, and it took them a little longer to get Doug ashore. Uh, and by that time, uh, he was dead. Mm -hmm. He didn't make it. And we all know on some level that we're going to die. Uh, and we spend a lot of time pushing that fact aside. Uh, and you, you talk about how Western culture hasn't always been that way and that how looking at death, you've had a couple of real close encounters with it, can um, you know, change our relationship with, with nature. So talk about that, how death and nature. Yeah, um, in that avalanche that I was in with Yvonne and two other close friends uh, in uh, a remote part of Tibet, uh, one of my closest friends uh, died in, in my arms uh, and we buried him on the side of the mountain. And uh, we were in that avalanche for a full minute. And in, for a full minute, I thought I was, I was dead. And then I had, years later, this uh, similar second experience with Doug's death, similar in that I also, at the same time, assumed I was going to die. So I went through that a couple times. Uh, and then just two years ago, uh, my wife of nearly 40 years died uh, from cancer. And from those experiences, but also rooted in this life, outdoors, um, close to nature, I've been able to get into my bones and internalize uh, the, the, the knowledge, the deep knowledge that, that all life is framed by death, and life doesn't exist without death. The Buddhist and impermanence of things, yeah. There's something of a paradox in the inherent in the outdoor industry itself. I mean, how do you resolve the tension between encouraging people to get outdoors so they have a stake in wanting to protect wilderness and that lead to potentially trampling it? You know, the national parks have seen during COVID have seen almost an overwhelming number of people which are straining the parks. Yet, is that a good thing, bad thing? How do you see that? Well, we need more parks. That would be uh, the solution I would, I would advocate. And we don't need to have less people going to fewer parks. We need just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is that time in nature, as I said early, Greg, um, that it, it, it's that time in nature that teaches us uh, so much uh, that can enrich our lives. It's not just a place of solace, but it's certainly that. But, but it's, a, it's a place where we can learn in a deep way how we humans are part of nature, how we fit into the web of life. And we can fall in love with nature. And only when you fall in love with nature, you're going to be really committed to saving nature. So uh, if we uh, want to really get the earth to uh, half earth, uh, to where uh, half of the earth is protected, uh, which uh, we've actually validated with the best science done before, the up to now, is going to be a super important uh, goal to keep the earth to 1.5 degrees. But if we're going to get there, we're going to have to have a lot more people in love with nature, advocating for the protection of nature and pressuring uh, their representatives and, and, and politicians to create more protected areas. That's the solution. It's not in restricting uh, access but rather doing just the opposite. And looking at uh, extinction, resource uh, constraints, climate change, you know, the root cause is too many people buying too much stuff. Yeah. So how do we get at that? Yeah, um, and, and that's something I learned doing uh, the research uh, for that ad, uh, the don't buy this jacket ad. 
more than that, it's what I learned from Doug Tompkins. Doug was a deep ecologist. Uh, deep ecology is the philosophy of um, understanding deeply how human beings are just the part of the web of life and nature. And through that understanding, uh, committing to respect all of a life on Earth and all wildlife. Uh, and Doug was early into that philosophy through a Norwegian named Arne Ness, and also through his engagement with a group called the Club of Rome. And they were a group of macroeconomists that you probably know, know about. You're nodding your head, uh, understandably, who, you know, as you'll recall, uh, in the 70s, uh, started to really understand uh, the source of the impact of human beings on the planet, uh, measured not just by the number of people on the planet, but more importantly, by the amount of resources those people were using uh, from a planet that has a limited capacity to provide those resources for all of its human activities. And, and that's the problem. It's, it is too many people, but the real problem is too many people using too much stuff. And that, and that circle, see how that links right back to uh, the wrestling match we had in Patagonia about uh, whether we're going to continue to grow uh, the origins of that um, of that uh, ad, uh, don't buy this jacket. And there was an accompanying uh, essay in our catalog that year uh, that I wrote called The Elephant in the Room. Um, and it was about this very topic uh, that we're talking about right now and, and trying to challenge all of us to think about it because it's really uh, a direct challenge to uh, capitalism as is. Like you can't have uh, an, eco an economic system based on annual compounded growth right. without eventually getting to the cliff and going over. It just won't work long term. We're, we're trapped in this, this, this growth paradigm because uh, companies are judged by that you know, compounded quarterly annual growth. And yet when that growth stops, uh, the economy collapses, people lose their jobs, people are yeah. hurt, and yet we're trapped. And nobody's, nobody knows how to get out of the trap yet. Uh, Doug Tompkins referred to it as a predicament uh, rather than a crisis because he said crises, you know, people rally people to find solutions, and predicaments are a little more difficult. And, and this is our greatest uh, predicament. And that's what I tried to explain in the essay. And it didn't offer a solution because nobody has a solution to offer. Like we just all got to get together or to figure this out. Growing the different kinds of things or valuing yeah. differently. And the idea was just to see if we could get people to think a little differently, to start challenging themselves. And I wondered whether we were effective. And a few months after that article came out, I was in Washington for an event at the World Wildlife Fund, their 50th anniversary. And there was a lot of, you know, uh, important people there. <laughs> and uh, in the reception, I was introduced to the new uh, president of the World Bank. And he shook my hand. And um, then he turned to the next person, you know, and shook their hand. And I was just standing there. And then he stopped and he turned back to me. He said, did you say you were from Patagonia? And I said, yeah. He says, did you guys write that article in your catalog called The Elephant in the Room? And I said, yeah. And he says, I had that co article photocopied and I sent it to every vice president in the World Bank and I said, we got to start talking about this. So I, we got the conversation going. How do you think we should address the climate crisis? What's your prescription? If growth is this underlying problem that no one really has an answer for, what do we do about climate? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, I'm, I'm working with a group, uh, One Earth right now, that has funded the science to um, try and determine uh, if scaling renewable energy and scaling the conservation of protected areas and scaling the conversion of food and fiber production to regenerative protocols could keep the planet to 1.5 degrees. And uh, the science that uh, it, we're nearing the completion of the science and the, uh, and the answer is really encouraging because it's a yes. It, it, it's a yes that we can do that. Regenerative food and fiber, scaling renewables and conservation. Yeah. Yeah, and and we've and we started to, and we funded the science to figure out how much in each of those three areas we need to do to keep the plant to 1.5 degrees, and we're presenting uh, our um, uh, scientific conclusions uh, at Glasgow uh, in a couple weeks. So, the, the, and and the cool thing is these are all solutions that are already exist. You know, you don't have to come up with some giant carbon scrubber to, you know, clean the air, and you don't have to launch off into space to try to you know, populate Mars. 
companies are tripping all over themselves, declaring goals of net zero carbon emissions. Some people look at the absence of strong policy, look to companies to, to carry the ball forward on climate. Should we trust corporations to be part of climate solutions? Um, well, we should all be, uh, you know, we should all be being dubious is is a is is a is a good position. Being skeptical, but not cynical. There's a you know that core difference between being a skeptic and a, and a cynic. But skepticism is good when you're trying to um, uh, parse whether uh, uh, any company's claims to sustainability are, are legitimate or not. But in, increasingly, they really are, uh, and and it's because the individuals running these big companies. Uh, really are starting to understand uh, the threat of climate change to their businesses. And it's even going deeper than that. I, in my position at Patagonia, had the good fortune to meet many of these people, um, uh, CEOs running the biggest companies in the world. Uh, and sometimes I get to go out, you know, camping with them uh, around the fire where, uh, you know, their corporate speak fades away and you really learn what they're about. And what I learned with many of these people is that um, the big change comes at home. Uh, and the big change for so many of them uh, is at the dinner table. When their kids look at them and say, what are you doing about this, dad or mom? What would you like your legacy to be? Well, I started off really focused on the sports and the goals and the summit, you know, and, and the adventure with my friends like the first story in the book, the Everest story, where we started our conversation. And then over the course of my life, it became not about the sports, but about protecting the place where we did the sports. Uh, so I suppose if there's any legacy it's that I would love to have, it's just I might be the guy that did everything he could to protect what's left of our wild and single home planet. It's about the journey, not reaching the top. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be hard and depressing. It also can be exciting and interesting. So please help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or review. It really does help open up the climate conversation. So thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.